Today I'm at the Evergreen Air and Space Museum in Oregon. And behind me in that building is the Spruce Goose, the H-4 Hercules built by Howard Hughes for the World War II war effort. At the onset of World War II, Germany's U-boats controlled much of the Atlantic, punishing the Allied shipping and transport. By 1942, the U.S. War Department began searching for an alternative method to move people and cargo to Europe, and began looking for ways to do it through the air. Henry Kaiser, an American industrialist and shipbuilder, most notable for his construction of Liberty ships supporting the war effort, came up with the idea of a flying cargo ship and introduced the idea to the eccentric business magnate and record-setting pilot Howard Hughes. Together, they began to formulate a draft of a plane capable of carrying 150,000 pounds, which could be anything from 750 fully loaded troops to two 30-ton Sherman tanks. The War Department issued the pair a contract that year, requesting three planes built by 1944. After several different variations were drawn up, the final design was decided and construction began on what would be far and away the largest aircraft built at the time. Holding the title of longest aircraft for over 20 years and widest aircraft for almost 71 years, most cargo planes of the time, like the DC-3, could park comfortably underneath its wing. The catch, though, was that it couldn't utilize war essential materials, specifically aluminum. The result was that the largest plane ever built would be made almost entirely of wood and fabric, resulting in the nickname the Spruce Goose, despite being mostly built of birch. Officially, it was known as the HK-1, and then the H-4 Hercules. The Hercules would be a seaplane in order to allow it to fly across the Atlantic, stopping in ports just like a ship would to refuel and refit as necessary. And because there were very few, if any, airports that would be able to host a plane of that size. Problems continuously arose though, as those specific material requirements, combined with Hughes's focus on absolute perfection, eventually drove Kaiser out of the partnership and Hughes carried on under an updated contract with the government, which was to produce just one plane. Construction dragged on, with completion coming over two years after the end of World War II, and at a cost of $23 million, around $250 million today. This resulted in Hughes being called to testify to the Senate about possible misuse of government funds, spurring him to prove the construction was merited. He did this by planning operational tests back in Long Beach, California, where the H-4 was hangered. On November 2, 1947, Hughes, with 21 crew members and 14 members of the media and associated industries, took the seaplane out to conduct several taxi tests. Two were completed before four of the seven press members left to send off their write-ups. On the third and final taxi, Hughes got the H-4 to 135 miles per hour, pulled back on the controls, and lifted off, flying the plane 70 feet above the water for almost half a minute and covering a mile in the air, proving to his doubters and to the Senate that the plane was a successful undertaking, although by that time, it was no longer needed. This would be the only flight of the only H-4 built despite Hughes paying a full staff of 300 to keep it in flying condition for nearly 30 more years after that one and only flight. The design of the Hercules included some unique and in some cases odd features due to both building constraints as well as Howard Hughes's eccentric personality. Fire suppression was a major concern with systems being continuously updated. Beach balls, used as emergency flotation in the event that the Hercules were to crash, were inflated in 1947 and remain so today. The cockpit, five stories above waterline, had a fresh filtered air tube fitted to Hughes's seat, so that at no point did he have to risk breathing air someone else had potentially ingested. In a similar thought process, he ensured no one else could receive credit for flying the plane besides him by forbidding anyone with the pilot's license to board to include the quote-unquote co-pilot, or more correctly, the guy riding in the right seat breathing unfiltered cabin air. Others breathing less than fresh air included the eight engineers posted in the wings behind each engine, monitoring them throughout the operational tests, and who probably didn't expect to take flight that day when Hughes decided to lift off. Despite this, their efforts, combined with the skill of thousands of workers and with Hughes's vision, resulted in one of the most impressive aircraft ever to be built, the H-4 Hercules. Thanks for watching, and as always, until next time, 
get lost. <laughs>